that all Russian writers, I mean, Pushkin, Gogol, Dostoevsky, uh, Turgenev, all of these people uh, associate with the great European capitals, the worst of all being St. Petersburg. It is simply the organization of organization. It is a bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. Now, if you want to say that Dostoevsky was a monarchist and Gogol, that's that's true. They were both firm monarchists, but they hated the idea of St. Petersburg and organization and bureaucracy. In fact, I'm going to go so far, and I know I'm with Gogol and Dostoevsky in this particular regard, that the Petrogradian bureaucracy was the negation of Russian monarchy. To claim that in the second half of the 19th century the Russian monarch was absolute is 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 superficial uh, simpleton thinking. No. There was only one absolute in Russia in the late 19th century and that was the bureaucratic apparatus. And that's something that most historians and social writers uh, then and now don't grasp. The monarchy was not only limited, but was very much a figurehead dominated by an oligarchic, uh, self-interested, uh, scientifically organized bureaucracy. And this is something that the average Russian peasant was able to intuit in a way that um, the intellectuals could not. The Tsar was a good man. That's true. He was a good man. But the people who surrounded him and dominated him, the people who he depended on for information, they were not necessarily good men. They were victims of the same obsession with organization and the scientific technique that created modern managerialism, bureaucracy, and totalitarianism. The bourgeoisie came to power in the name of some abstract freedom, but it, it took very, very short period of time for them to show that they really only cared about their financial self-interest. And once that was taken care of, everyone else could go to hell. This is the bourgeois lie. This is bourgeois hypocrisy, because they're always going to talk about freedom, even as they spout from the other side of their mouth the doctrine of materialism. They'll talk about freedom and democracy, but what they really mean, of course, um, uh, is is to uh, clear a path for their own control over the population, and most insidious of all, using these hapless, ignorant politicians to cover for their own crimes. So, for example, in modern America, you have people, you have the ignorant, uh, you have the ignorant frauds of American talking heads talking about politicians, you know, presidents and Supreme Court justices and Speaker of the House and major senators and committee chairs and everything else having some control over the economy. The Reagan economy was good. The Bush economy was bad. The Clinton economy was good. Uh, the Bush two economy was bad. You know, the point is, of course, is that politicians usually usually have minimal control of the economy. Bankers and industrialists and currency traders and stock traders, these are the people who, collectively speaking, have control over the economy. And yet they spend a lot of time making sure that you think that this has something to do with these hapless, ignorant politicians. That somehow politicians are running the country, when in reality it's media elites and economic elites. Uh, politicians are their um, front men who are shockingly ignorant about social philosophy and social theory and how power works. Uh, and they, and they uh, are said to run the country and run the economy and everything else, when in fact, of course, it is economic actors who run the economy. It's the major corporations and banks and media, and they are, of course, not elected, and they usually meet in secret, and the politicians, of course, take the blame for their success, and they take the blame for their failures. So the bourgeoisie, in fact, are the ultimate fraudsters. And we can go back to the Medici in Florence and Italy during the uh, Renaissance, 
to see how this is. I mean, the major bankers hide. They hire politicians to spout their line. They're given power and women and uh, cash and everything else. And what, what's expected of them is that they take the fall for any failure of other non-elected economic actors, or in some cases, bureaucratic actors. That's the hypocrisy. That's the lie of bourgeois rule. Dostoevsky, in Winter Notes and elsewhere, he talks about the middle classes, not just in in Europe, um, but in Russia and Ukraine as well. And he he views them as the ultimate in vulgarity. They want to be aristocrats without adopting the aristocratic virtues. It's very, very, you know, it's central in European history that um, economic elites try to buy aristocratic titles. And they, they want the power of the aristocracy, but without the social responsibility of the aristocracy. They want an aristocratic status, but they don't want the polish that comes with real aristocratic life. And they reduce intelligence to deviousness. Intelligence is largely confined to manipulating money or manipulating the labor of others. That they are not necessarily immoral people. They're too ignorant to fully understand one way or the other. They are amoral people. They're amoral people because they have assigned moral worth to those that are able to control money. And again, I want to say that money and stock, these things really represent the labor of the working class. And that is manipulated uh, for the benefit of the middle and upper middle classes in modern society. So, Dostoevsky and Brodayev and Gogol, they are all talking about modern life as inherently deceptive, inherently exploitative. It's, it's inherently evil. Evil in a way that previous societies could never be. And as I said before on this show, it has created a new religion. It's a new pantheon of pagan gods based on media image and money. What modern man worships are celebrities, and that these celebrities mirror almost exactly the old pantheon of the Greek and Roman gods. You have the warrior god, and you have the god of sexuality and sensuality. You have the god of power and money. You have the god of science. You have the god, you know, you have the political gods and social gods. This is the case in Egypt, Greece, and Rome. And you have it manifested, in some cases explicitly so, in the new pantheon of celebrities, you know, including people like, say, Obama or uh, a certain general or a, a political figure or a, a banker or a capitalist like Warren Buffett. You know, I mean, you know, you have all of these gods and goddesses of this new modern pantheon with a handful of media elites who are in the background manipulating how um, uh, how it actually works. And even worse than all of this is that this domination comes at the destruction of the natural world. Dostoevsky is writing this in 1862, 1863, and he's saying that wherever the capitalists come in, they'll destroy their surroundings, including the people. They'll destroy the natural beauty of the area with their smokestacks and everything else because they don't care. There's only one virtue, and that is the manipulation of 